Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video. This one is going to be intense today. There is a lot of difficult stuff in this one, so just be prepared. If you need to skip it, you can do. Recently, I have fallen down a deep, dark, seemingly bottomless pit of alpha male and pickup artist books. And when I first started researching this video, I figured it would be a silly one. We could have a giggle about it. And then it very quickly became terrifying and exhausting. And I wish I was exaggerating there. The fact that there are so many people out there who actually believe the stuff written in these books and act in these ways, and that there are so many people who are teaching others to do the same thing is scary. These kinds of books treat women purely as objects. Like I've literally seen game guides that discuss video game obstacles and level walkthroughs with more respect than how these men talk about actual human women. One author in particular that I came across calls himself Roosh V and I found him after stumbling across this really old Reddit thread complaining that his books had been banned from Amazon, in some countries anyway, despite them not being that bad according to these posters. So of course I just had to look them up because this is what I do. I torture myself for you guys. So welcome to the world of Roosh V, a true artist and critical thinker. <sighs> what more could you want in a man, baby? What more could you want? See, even Kyra loves him. Isn't that right? What do you mean no? What do you mean you've read the books and you know what he's like? Usually lists of the greatest non-fiction books of all time contain silly little contributions like Hawkins's Brief History of Time or Dawkins's Selfish Gene or perhaps anything written by Oliver Sacks. But none of these come close to the true genius that is Roosh V. You might know him from such inspirational works such as Bang, More Lays, In 60 Days, and the even more creatively titled Day Bang! How to casually pick up girls during the day. Then of course there's the incredibly unique 30 Bangs. The shaping of one man's game from patient mouse to rabid wolf. And then of course we have the classic game. How to meet, attract, and date women. Uh, just a quick spoiler for that one. Tip number one should be by not buying this book, but for some reason it's not, so we really missed a trick there. There's the well ahead of its time, Bang Ukraine. How to sleep with Ukrainian women, get this, in Ukraine. And just to show that this man is not a misogynist and he does write books for women too, he has the absolute classic, Lady how to keep and meet a good man for love and marriage. Now with quality work like this, how could anyone want to ban his books, I hear you ask? I know, I was asking the same thing. So, I don't know, maybe we should take a look inside. In today's video, we will primarily be looking at his first book titled Bang, and the follow-up, 30 Bangs. I um, it's when I utter sentences like this that I sometimes sit and ask myself, like, how is this my job? <laughs> What am I doing with my life? <laughs> Normally when I review these kinds of books, I kind of go through them chronologically and pick them apart bit by bit. But what I've done for this video, because there's so much to talk about, is I've taken the best and worst bits from both books and organized them into categories. And to start up, we're talking about Roosh. What a nice guy. So the first book, Bang, opens with Roosh telling us what a typical nice guy he used to be. And this explains a hell of a lot about him and how he got to where he is today. But surprisingly, it's not at all the worst part of the book. I figured, you know, we'd start off easy with something only a little bit disgusting and not completely horrifying. So he says, It started in the spring of 2001. I was 21 years old and spent my free time on the computer reading message boards or playing games. I had no skill with women and the ones I knew either used me for my brain to tutor them or as an emotional tampon to feel better about the guys who didn't take their shit. So straight up, I hate that term so much, emotional tampon. It's horrible, horrible, isn't it? What they mean by that is, here's a woman who saw you as a friend and you're gonna complain about it. Because this is what humans do with friends. They talk about things and care about each other and help each other out and ask for support when they need it. That's not using someone, that's a friendship because it's expected to be mutual. The fact that men like this get bitter about women trying to form a non-sexual emotional connection with them just says to me that they've clearly never really had a deep, real friendship with anyone, including men, so I have to ask what is wrong with them? It's really messed up. A woman talking openly to you and being emotional and trying to share things with you, that's not her using you, that's her saying, let's form an emotional bond, let's be friends. How does he not see this? I remember thinking how stupid the other guys were to treat such pretty and nice girls so poorly. 
Didn't they realise those girls will eventually get angry and stop talking to them? My friends were unsuccessful with women too, what a surprise. So we all reinforced our lack of skill during all night games of risk or poker. I wanted to get out of that cycle, but felt I had little control to make a change. This is just about a stereotypical nice guy as it gets, and the thing is like, does he not see that he's one of the men treating women poorly? He's not a nice guy and better than the others. He's causing them harm as well. These women that he says use him as an emotional tampon, they're there trying to form a friendship with him and he's being bitter and angry and saying, oh, why is she opening up to me and sharing personal feelings when she should just be having sex with me? That's a revolting way to treat people. He might have been maybe nice to this girl's face, which is why she felt she could open up to him and try and be his friend, but clearly it was a disingenuous act. It wasn't real and that means he's not really a nice guy at all. If your kindness towards someone is an act based on the fact you're trying to get them to have sex with you, then you're not very nice. He tells a story of him asking out one girl and she turns him down, it turns out, because she was seeing someone else. And he says, I was bitter that I, a nice guy, was getting passed over for guys I thought were losers. It's insane, isn't it? This is almost like a parody and I, I can't believe it's not. Really cannot believe it's not. I started to ignore her. If I did end up talking to her, I cut our conversation short. When she asked me to study, I'd lie and say I was studying alone, only to have her stumble upon my study group late at night in the library. This is horrible, she won't have sex with you, so you like exclude her from all social gatherings. Horrible. I started feeling good for treating her poorly. I hated her and everything she stood for, which was my failure with women. Ah yes, because if a woman doesn't have sex with you, what's the point in her, right? It's disgusting. You don't treat other people like this who are just trying to be your friend. It she started making a strong effort to gain my attention and favour. It was as if the harder I pulled away, the closer she would come to me. Yeah, because she thought you were friends. And if you suddenly start treating her awfully, of course she's going to try and make an effort to find out what's wrong and why you've just thrown away a friendship that clearly she valued, even if you didn't. If one of my friends, male or female, just suddenly like started lying and saying that, oh, I can't see you for this, I'd be like, why? Talk to me, What what's happened here? What have I done wrong? That's anyone's natural reaction. She's not doing that because you're treating her badly and she likes that. She's doing it because she wants to repair this friendship you, she thought you had. That was the first time I understood that changing my behavior could affect how girls reacted to me. How the hell do you get to be an adult and this is the first time you're realizing that how you treat people affects how they treat you too? I don't get it. Hi baby. Love you. I'm feeling a little stressed because it's a horrible book. Don't know how many of you have seen my videos before, but um, Kyra here is very in tune with like my emotions and she can pick up on like my tone of voice and she also picks up on little things like if my heart re heartbeat raises or my breathing increases or something like that. So when I'm talking about something horrible like, you know, some of these books I talk about on my channel and things that get emotional, like she often wants to come to me and comfort me and it makes her a little bit anxious because she's like, oh no, mommy's upset. Must help. A yinky isn't that right, my little support pup? Then he starts talking about how he began to game women, which means manipulating them to get sex and only sex from them. He says, you'll need to interact with a large number of women in different situations and environments. It's not enough to just talk to the women you normally come into contact with at work or school. Like a salesman, you need to make cold calls to get leads in the form of approaches. Because that's how it is with guys like this. It's never quality that counts, only quantity. It's Oh, it feels like such a sad little life. This is the underlying theme of every single one of his books. He doesn't care about forming genuine connections with anyone. He doesn't care about having good sex. He doesn't even care all that much about attracting women that he's actually attracted to. All he wants to do is rack up the numbers and say like, I had this many sexes today, like some spoilt child going through a mine phase, you know? Where everything's like, mine, mine, mine. Isn't that right? Like you and your balls. Yes. And every toy that someone leaves in the garden. Isn't that right? You're like, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. So what we can gather is that Rouge V is less emotionally mature than my nine-year-old dog. Isn't that right, baby? What is very, very funny though, is that he's clearly not actually that successful. Despite having one book called 30 Bangs, I am very dubious as to how many of them are actually real. But also, that was written quite far on in his career as a pickup artist. In one of his earlier books, I found this line in which he says he finally got to sleeping with double figures of women 
a few years after he started his dating advice blog and he implies that the blog helped him get more women. But that's the thing, in the space of years, he doesn't say how many, but in the space of years, 10 people isn't really a lot. And when you read his book, you see he hits on a lot of women. Based on what I've read, he very clearly goes out out at least once a week, often more, and he says sometimes he tries it on with five or six girls in a club on any one night. Um, he also talks about hitting on women everywhere he goes, so shops, cafes, bookstores, gyms, to name a few. So let's imagine he leaves the house once a day and he's probably hitting on two to three women each time because that's what he says he does. He's like, take every opportunity, blah, blah, blah. So if we're going on the lower end of things, that's approximately 26 women every week that he's hitting on if not more, 52 weeks in a year. Let's be kind and say that these years since he started his blog are three, for example. That's over 4,000 women he's hit on and he slept with 10 of them at that point. That's a 0.25% success rate. Is that really the kind of man you wanna be taking sex and dating and pickup advice from? That said, there is one small part of the book which offers relatively good advice, keyword there being relatively. So he goes into a bit of detail about how you need self-confidence and you need to sort out your own head because that's the only thing that you can really control. You can't control how other people will react to you and respond to you, but you can control how you feel about yourself and how you react to other people, which is actually pretty, pretty good advice. You know, he says stuff like, internal game is the game that goes on inside your head. The thoughts and beliefs that affect your behavior and ultimately how others respond to you. For example, if you have a belief that appearance is very important in getting laid and you're not a good looking guy, you'll talk to fewer girls and get laid less often. How you think about appearance, masculinity and the concept of the game will tie into your result. Which, I mean, I don't like the whole game thing and the whole like just trying to get laid thing, but I don't hate the underlying sentiment there of like have confidence in yourself and believe in yourself and you'll get better results. Do you know what I mean? I don't hate that. If you think appearance is important and you consider yourself unattractive, you've doomed yourself to spend most of your time behind a computer. You need to have belief that game, not appearance, is important. And then go out there and play the hand you've been dealt. So in this sentence here, replace game with something more substantial and less manipulative, like for example, personality, attitude, self-confidence, and he's actually onto something not that bad. But then there's this whole section about how you should get used to rejection and not let it get to you, which again isn't the worst part of the book. And then some really bad science about activation energy. Let's just not. So all in all, these parts of the books aren't the worst thing I've ever read, but there is one more small thing that he lets on about that just personally gave me pause. And this is more of a just, this means I don't like him and trust him kind of thing. Other people might not have this response, but he gives this example email that he sent to a woman and in it, he lets slip that he hates dogs. What kind of monster hates dogs? I could never be friends with someone or trust someone and I wouldn't touch a man who hated dogs. Just fears and phobias, I get, but just flat out hate hating dogs is something I'll never understand. They're wonderful, they're loyal, they're kind, they're full of unconditional love. How can you hate that? Plus they're cute as hell. I try not to judge people too much and I like to think that everyone can grow and learn and improve, but this is one thing I will never budge on. If you don't like dogs, what is wrong with you? But let's be honest, it's not just dogs that he hates, but women too. So let's move on to the next section, which I have titled Objectifying Women. So the first time he actually talks about any specific women is surprisingly far into his first book, Bang. So before this, it's all been hypotheticals and general... Nah. This is the first time he gets specific and it is creepy as hell. It completely objectifies this woman and his actions towards her are scary and weird. Aren't they cuckoo? Yeah, would you like to grumble into the microphone for me? What do you have to say about this? <laughs> There you go. Walking around this farm in Virginia on a hundred degree day, I saw a tall, curvy girl wearing high heel cork sandals matched with a skimpy outfit. I noticed that girls were checking her out as much as the guys. I stalked her at the wine festival, fantasizing about her like every other guy. An hour later, I looked to my left and saw her standing under a tent with her back towards me. I walked up to her from behind, 
touched her upper back tattoo and asked, what does this mean? I banged her three weeks later. I wouldn't have believed you if you told me just a year earlier that I'd pulled one of the hottest girls at a huge public gathering just by sneaking up on her and touching her. Oh my god, there, uh, there is so much wrong with this. Where do you even start? Notice how the only way he describes it is through her looks. I have seen writers talk about tables with more personality than this woman. Who is this woman? What is her name? What does she do for a living? Why was she at the wine festival? What are her hobbies and interests? Does she have family and friends? What are her motivations for sleeping with this creep? Why is she doing it? Rouge never bothers to describe any of that or probably doesn't even remember any of that because that would mean admitting that women are complex, unique individuals and not just walking plastic vaginas for him to take and use and discard as he pleases. The idea of women being humans too is a little too complex for his tiny little brain. The other thing I want you to focus on here is his specific word choice when he talks about women, not just only focusing on their bodies and this and that, but listen to what he says. It's not, we had sex. It's not even, I manipulated her and convinced her to sleep with me. It's, I banged her. Like, I bought the table, I stole the cake, I broke the vase. It's treating her as an object that he uses, that he does something to. It's showing that he's the one who sees himself in the only position of power. He doesn't see her as an equal or even a sentient individual. He sees her as an object to be used that he did use and then discards. And you'll see this repeated throughout every single book of his and every time he talks about a woman. There's no, we did this. There's no equality. It's just, I banged her. I humped her. <laughs> Not joking. I used her, you know? He actually expands on this particular story in his other book, 30 Bangs, which that whole book is something else. It's basically really, really, really badly written erotica, which he's trying to pass off as, oh my god, all these things like totally happened to me, yeah? It's awful. We're gonna read a lot of examples from that book as we go through the video, especially, actually I'm not gonna spoil it, but that book is something else. It's one of the worst things I've ever read. <laughs> She was very receptive, surprising since I had essentially stalked her and intruded on her physical space in a non-club setting. Then again, women continue to reward the bold moves made by men because of the confidence it displays. Or, hear me out, women try to appease men who scare them. When you stalk a woman and touch them without their consent and scare them while you're drunk, because he says he was drunk at this point, he was at this wine festival, he'd had a bunch of stuff, so he's drunkenly following this woman around and touching her, of course she's gonna act nicely because if she doesn't, she might end up dead. All women have this fear because it happens to so many of us. If we're not dead, we end up raped. If we're not raped, we end up hurt. If we're not hurt, we end up insulted. These things happen all the time. So of course you have to try and act nicely towards these people who are scaring you. And it's so bizarre to me because it's like, he's aware that these actions are bad and scary and dangerous. He's admitting that. He just doesn't care. He doesn't care what effect they actually had on her, he just calls it a success because he wore her down enough to get what he wanted in the end. This whole story of his interaction with her is just him scaring her one time after another, another, and being relentless and not giving up and pushing and pushing and pushing until he finally got to have sex with her. This isn't a nice story. There's nothing in the story that suggests she was actually interested in him. It's just him wearing down woman after woman after woman. That's this entire book. The way he talks about these things, it's like, you know when you watch a serial killer documentary and you see like interviews with them and sometimes like, you know when you see those like really cold detached serial killers who just talk about like what they did to their victims in such a casual way where like, you know, the really scary ones that'll be like, yeah, so I went to the shop and I bought milk and then I came home and I stabbed her 30 times because she was annoying me. And I fancied a toaster sandwich, so I had that. And I mean, like at least I could eat it in peace at that point. So that was good. And you know how you see people talk like that so like detached from a really horrific thing they did. They're the vibes I get here. The more he tells his story, the creepier it gets. Um, the way he brags about this is just, ugh. It's so weird, it's not sexy, it's just creepy. Um, so apparently he wears this girl down enough um, that he like drags her to this hotel room and she still refuses to have sex with him. And then the next morning he gets in the shower with her and we like she finally sleeps with him and then we get this interaction. And I'm so sorry for how graphic this is. It's 
is really, really gross. Like, sex in general isn't gross, but this description is. It will make your skin crawl. After sex, she complimented my bedroom skill and asked if I'd been with tons of women. I didn't want to tell her that I was in fact very inexperienced, so I kept it vague. What do you mean by tons, I said. I've been with a few girls. Actually, I've never had sex without a condom. In passing, not as a scheme to do her raw. A few minutes later, she grabbed my dick and put it in. My eyes rolled into the back of my head and my mouth, my mouth hung open. I was literally drooling on her while moaning in ecstasy. I had never felt such intense pleasure before and decided that I wanted to be her boyfriend so I could experience it forever. I ejaculated all over her back, partially obscuring her tattoo. After our amazing first date, I went completely beta on her, contacting her too often, showing more affection than she did, and doing romantic things like lighting a million candles in the bedroom, which made sex intolerably sweaty. She let me hit a couple more times before dumping me for good, saying that I was just a rebound. So one, I'm guessing she never actually said any of this. Two, this is a really great way to get and spread STDs. Don't do this. It's stupid and irresponsible and not something to brag about, but we'll talk more about that later. And three, my eyes rolled into the back of my head and my mouth hung open. I was literally drooling on her. Is not nice or sexy or anything to brag about. Um, and it's not just this woman. The objectifying of women continues over and over and over. In every story, we get a vague description of how they look and then never anything more. Here are some examples. Her face was just okay, but her body was a model of perfection with legs that seemed to go on forever. She was very petite, but with large C-cup breasts. Oh look, another man who clearly doesn't know how bra sizes work. A C-cup means nothing on its own without knowing the band size. It's not necessarily big or small. The Czech girl was extremely cold and barely talked, but I went for her number anyway because I wanted another petite trophy to add to my collection. God, calling women trophies and collections, it's just absolutely vile. If you'd like more examples, here are all his chapter titles from 30 Bangs. These all refer to different women. There's one story of a woman who he only ever refers to as big ass, who he then goes on to be absolutely disgustingly disrespectful to and about, because clearly she wasn't taking any of his crap, right? She was a hyper-educated feminist who thought she knew everything about the world, repeatedly saying things that turned off my wang. I responded with slight jabs like, are you always like this? Or don't you ever stop? To let her know I wasn't enjoying the conversation. Instead of feeling slighted, she laughed, which told me she liked me and probably wanted to have intimacy in the near future. I'm gonna bet she didn't laugh and she didn't say this. The first bit though, I fully believe that happened. Does not surprise me. Um, I'm gonna guess it happened and bruised his fragile ego so badly that he ended up writing the whole rest of this story as just like a fantasy piece, um, kind of, you know, fan fiction about his own life and he just used it as an excuse to be awful about her because he was intimidated by the real life her. I didn't mind the prospect, since her ass was abnormally large and I wanted to hit it from the back. Her masculine attitude all but assured this would be a pump and dump. The more she talked, the less I wanted to have sex with her, but her gigantic ass was begging to be demolished. What a revolting sad little man. Oh, while we're here, let's add in a little bit of fetish fetishization of different races into the mix too, because why not? Roosh is an equal opportunity misogynist. He is an intersectional misogynist. There was a Latin themed lounge I had started to frequent. Even though most of the girls were fat and unsightly, I made plays on the occasional cute girl. I made penetrating my first Latina a high priority. Let's look at another example to show how he just, he lacks all empathy towards people, but especially women. He really doesn't care about anyone but himself, it's disgusting. In between her telling me silly things such as, my childhood was harder than most other people, I wrapped my arm around her back. Wait, it gets worse. We sat in her living room and she brought out a photo album of when she was little. That made things strange while I was fucking her because the image of her as a little girl kept trying to enter my mind. Wait. It gets worse. The sex was incredibly bad, but her vagina was tighter than a man's anus. That said, I do wonder how he knows what that comparison is like. That said, of course the sex was bad. You were involved. 
and <laughs> that that's not even just me being like rude for the sake of it. No, he he's terrible in bed and he tells us on a number of occasions. Although we're gonna look at some examples of that and go into detail later in the video. Seriously, I have a whole section called bad in bed. Just you wait. <sighs> if this isn't enough objectifying women, here's another one. Most of them were dressed sloppily, wearing cheap summer dresses and flip-flops, putting as little effort into their appearance as possible. That trend was beginning to anger me. How fragile is your ego that you get angry about what other people are wearing, how other people are dressed, what other people look like, how much effort other people put into themselves? It's pathetic. He is just an entitled little man-child, isn't he? Then there's a whole chapter titled The Vegas Slut, in which he refers to women in bars in the following way. Again, every time I think it can't get worse, it did. The turnover was so fast, all we had to do was wait 15 minutes for new meat to arrive if we didn't like the current cuts on display. Uh, then, like any petulant child, he calls a woman a classic butterface. And we had sex 15 minutes later. It- oh god, I can't believe I'm actually saying this. It- uh, it was fine, but her pussy labia were beat up and stretched out looking like old, old roast beef. I am genuinely repulsed by this man. Who talks about other people this way? The thing is, like, I understand that, like, not everyone's gonna be perfect all the time, and if someone's angry with someone or emotional, of course they might throw out insults either at them or, like, when talking about them or something, like, not a nice human reaction, but it's a real human reaction and it happens. And I'm not saying we all have to be super nice to everyone all the time because that's just not realistic. But there's a big difference between, like, in a moment of anger, calling someone a name or like throwing an insult at them or something and what Rouge does which is this like calm calculated matter of fact insult 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 it's just really disgusting and I'm like what kind of person is he well we know exactly what kind of person he is I'm just how does he live with himself <sighs> but apparently there is a reason he's like this and the reason he says is because he's a alpha male is. So he writes a lot in all of his books about being an alpha male and in one section uh, he starts by asking his audience why should women want to sleep with you and not someone else and then he provides them with the right answer. Unless you answered because my game is tight and I think I'm the shit you're not going to get that girl. Simply being nice to her in the hope she'll want to bang isn't going to work. While she may not want a player, she does want a quality man who's experienced and knows what he's doing. It's important to realise that it will take a significant investment on your part before you start getting any quality girls. So I think maybe me and Rouge have different definitions of what it means to be a quality man. In fact, I think all women and Rouge have differing opinions on what it means to be a quality man. He defines quality men as confident, arrogant manipulators. I and most of the women, at least ones who are attracted to men, usually define quality men as kind, thoughtful, respectful and fun. But you know, what do I know? I'm just a stupid woman. Uh, he also goes on to define all quality men as alpha males. So he opens with talking about alpha and beta gorillas and then says, The alpha beta hierarchy isn't much different among humans. Beta males accept their low position and let a minority of alphas bang most of the desirable women until they're ready to work on becoming alpha males themselves. Except yeah, it's very, very, very different. I did a fair amount of research around this point and it seems that, well, the whole alpha beta thing in general is a big hot mess, to be honest. So the original study which brought up the concept of alpha males was published in the 70s and it was about wolves and a few years later it was disproven and said to be absolute crap by the man who first wrote it. His name was David Mech and he now fights incredibly hard to get people to stop publishing his original work and stop quoting all this alpha male stuff around wolves and other animals because he's like, mate, it was so wrong, so flawed, stop it. Most people nowadays, if we do talk about alpha males in animals, it tends to be in terms of certain primates, but not all primates, and in particular, gorillas is a big one. And to give Miss credit, this is what Roosh is referring to, not the wolf thing. However, while there is research about alpha male gorillas existing, it is absolutely not comparable to humans because our social structures are so completely 
different from each other. They're not even comparable in the slightest. So to make a comparison makes no sense. It would be like comparing the capacity to hold objects of a snake with no limbs and an octopus with eight limbs, and then saying, oh, well, if an octopus can do it, why can't this snake? So primatologist, which is a real thing and I think a great job title, um, and Harvard University professor Richard W. Wrangham spoke about this in detail in various papers and various articles, and he articulated it quite well and very, very simply in one little news article I read which said, in primates there is almost always a single dominance hierarchy, i.e. the one based on violence. But in humans, a single group can have multiple hierarchies, such as those based on skill in sport, scholarship, social skills, etc. A single all-encompassing definition of alpha can't and doesn't exist for humans. We're too socially complex. We roll in too many circles. And the skills and physical attributes we value vary from person to person and group to group. While in many circles being attractive and strong and socially dominant can help you achieve a higher status, that is not true for all circles. Theoretical physicists don't care how much you can bench, bro. <laughs> Just like the bros at the gym don't care about how much you know about black hole thermodynamics, nerd. <laughs> The bottom line, there are no human alphas, just humans who excel and or assume leadership roles in specific disciplines. This was backed up by Stanford professor Robert uh, Sapolsky, who quite simply stated, humans are more complex. We belong to more than one social circle. A man who might be a custodian by day might be a superstar DJ by night. When we speak of human alpha males today, it may be that we refer to the trait of social dominance. Studies have demonstrated that socially dominant men hold sway with many women and can evoke feelings of inferiority among men. But as we've seen, different social circles will have different skills and attributes to reach social dominance. There's not just a one size fits all. You can't just be an all round alpha male or not. It's not how it works. So to summarize, Rouge's entire ideology behind being an alpha male is flawed and just plain wrong. Where he's like, to be an alpha male and be dominant, you need this, 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 and this, might only be true in a very, very specific social situation and social hierarchy. In everything else, that will not make you an alpha at all. That will not make you socially dominant. That won't make women fall to their knees and beg for you to take them on the spot. So while he's flawed, he keeps running with it anyway. He says, back when humans lived in tribes, there were no books or tools to teach them about human psychology, behavior, or seduction. If you were a beta when you hit puberty, chances are you'd be a beta for life. But now the right behavior and attitude can be identified in studies studied. It's much easier for today's man to become an alpha male. So, at least he's aware that humans change and evolve and society's evolution affects human evolution and vice versa. He's just oversimplifying it and misunderstanding it. Despite writing with this arrogant, faux, confident attitude and being and making all these declarative statements, I get the sense that Roosh isn't actually very smart at all. First, let's take a look at the average beta male. His number one defining trait is a fear of going after what he desires. He doesn't pursue what he wants because he doesn't think he's capable of getting it. He's just pulling this stuff from his bum at this point, completely. He worries about other people's needs before his own. He quietly accepts accepts being disrespected. He seeks out his identity in areas unrelated to his masculinity, such as his cubicle job. He's passive in bed and waits for permission before escalating intimacy. Waits for permission before escalating intimacy? You mean he gets consent? You mean he's a good man? This is something every single person should be doing. It is not, and never will be, a bad thing. There's actually a really sweet song by Stornoway uh, called The Love Song of the Beta Male, and it's kind of like, so uh, Brian who wrote it is an ornithologist, so he studies birds. So he's really into like nature and seeing like, you know, alpha and beta patterns and stuff like that. And he decided to write this silly little love song playing on that idea, calling himself like a beta male and saying like, hey, I might not be strong and tough and all the things that like douchebags like this associate with being an alpha. He's like, I can't do any of that, but I'm always gonna be there for you. I'm always gonna care for you. And ultimately, like, that's what his wife loves and adores about him and why they have, like, this beautiful, gorgeous family and life together and stuff. And it's just a really, really sweet song. So, screw people like Roosh who think that's not what women want. They don't get it at all. The alpha male, on the other hand, lives much differently. First and foremost, he does what he wants to do. He doesn't concern himself with personal rejection or social failure. 
His needs, wants, and feelings come before anyone else's. So he's selfish. No one's judgement, dirty looks, opinions or laughter is going to stop him from getting what he wants. Yeah, but I bet he gets that quite a lot, doesn't he? <laughs> he doesn't ask for permission. If he wants to have sex with a girl, he uses his knowledge and skills to try to make it happen. His actions stem from desire instead of insecurity. Yeah, you could have fooled me here. <laughs> Rouge comes across as one of the most insecure men I've ever seen. He just hides it all behind fake confidence and acting like a predator. But it's still insecurity deep down underneath it all, isn't it? <laughs> The alpha male doesn't make apologies for being a man who has sexual needs. He doesn't hide his intentions with women, so they know how to provide him with what it is he wants. If a woman isn't comfortable with sex, he moves on and finds one who is. He isn't going to wait for a woman to serve his needs. He's not concerned if a woman rejects him in the bedroom. If he doesn't get it from her, he'll get it from someone else. As a sexual being, he expects women to be sexual as well. So he expects women to be sexual, but then mocks, degrades, and disrespects them when they are. No, really, he does. Here's an example. A girl's job is to resist penetration, even with the worthiest of men, and continue resisting as long as possible to preserve her value. She's afraid that by having sex with you too early, you'll think she's an easy slut, not worthy of another call. Her resistance is based more on logic than emotion, since she's going against what she desires. You need to break down her resistance using sh subtle persuasion and mind tactics that move the decision to have sex back into the emotional realm, where she can't help but succumb to her desire. You provide an environment where she gets caught in the moment, and things just happen, and feel natural. Another way to break down resistance is to pound away like a jackhammer until she just gets tired and gives in. <sighs> it is so outdated, and pathetic, and ultimately predatory. That is not a woman's job. We need to stop telling women that they need to resist, they need to play coy, they need to pretend they don't like sex. We need to allow women to express their sexuality however they like, and as frequently lit as they like, without having to make excuses, without shaming them afterwards, without telling them it's some bad, terrible, horrible thing that lowers their value. And part of that is stop referring to women who enjoy sex as easy sluts. Also, like, as I'll continue to say throughout this video, if you have to coerce someone into having sex with you, that is not sex, that is rape. If they're resisting, stop. If you have to pound away like a jackhammer until she gets tired and gives in, that is not sex, that is rape. There is no enthusiastic consent there, it is rape. Absolutely revolting. He says the alpha male has high expectations of women. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having high standards for someone you're dating. What's wrong is with how he defines what these standards should be for everyone. He says things like uh, the alpha male. He doesn't do nice things for them without expecting something in return. And uh, yes, the key to all healthy relationships, treating them transactionally. I get that relationships should be equal, give and take, people doing things for each other. But this is not the same as I won't do something for you without something in return, saying, I won't be nice to you unless you lick my pee pee. That's not a healthy relationship. So what does he want in return? Well, the only thing women are good for, right? Sex. Because we're too dumb and boring and silly to do anything else. He expects a girl who has his attention to be physically attractive, interesting, and sexually secure. If a girl tells him she'll only have sex after months of dating, he won't pursue her. Yeah. Because who would want to spend time building up mutual trust and respect in order to form a long-term relationship and bond with someone when you can just use and dispose of women like Lou Roll? I like sex as much as the next person, maybe more, but I would never touch a person who ever thought I owed it to them or who expected it from me on their time frame just because, oh look, they treated me like a human being this evening. Or at least pretended to. Oops, better jump into bed with them now. It always, always, always has to be a mutual thing. And that is something it never, ever, ever would be with a man like this. Which is why women like myself don't touch these men with like a 10 foot barge pole. If we use that barge pole to push them further away from us, you know, just... <sighs> he makes it clear that he's not on this earth to service her with free alcohol or food. Everything she gets from him must be earned. Please, <laughs> if all a man has to offer is free alcohol and food, he's not really offering much, is he? May I provide myself with as much of that as I need? 
Don't need a man to do it. The only thing I want from a man that I can't give myself is a little bit of good company every now and again and someone to talk to because, because you know, after a while conversations with yourself, they get a little bit samey, you know? I can't believe he thinks women have to earn all these pointless things that most women don't even want, but he never has to actually put in any work to earn anything from her, does he? He just has to exist and women fall at his feet. Because you know, he is an alpha male and sex is just owed to him, you know? It's pathetic. Most importantly, the alpha male is always willing to walk away. His power over women lies in the time and energy he chooses to spend with them. He understands that such a mindset will be noticed by the women he meets, and they will treat him with care and respect as a result. <coughs> Doubt it. <laughs> I don't think any woman respects a man like this. He makes it clear, by controlling the amount of attention he gives, that he won't tolerate disrespectful or frigid behaviour. If she doesn't like his attitude, she is free to find someone else who will put up with her, because he knows there are many women who know how to behave. No matter how much work he's put into a certain woman, he won't hesitate to drop her if she isn't responding the way he wants. Now. Here's the thing that I say in all my videos, and I say this to absolutely everyone, man, woman, non-binary, doesn't matter who you are. If you're dating and you're interested in dating, if someone isn't treating you the way you want to be treated, the way you deserve to be treated, it's absolutely okay to walk away as soon as you can. Because it's better to be in no relationship than in a bad relationship. And in some ways he's preaching the same sentiment, and I don't hate that. But, while I'm talking about things like having a partner who respects you, and cares for you, and inspires you, and has the same goals and values as you, Rouge is instead talking about, well, if she won't let me painfully hump her like a dog, then I'll treat her like a petulant child and threaten to leave her. And no, I'm not just being mean for the sake of it there, that's literally how he describes himself having sex later in the book. Quality man! <laughs> And you know the bit where he said if she doesn't like his attitude she's free to find someone else who'll put up with her because he knows there are many women who know how to behave? What this actually means is if a woman's too strong for you and has too much self-respect to put up with your crap, go find a more vulnerable target to take advantage of. It's repulsive. So now Rouge has established that you're a totally strong big boy alpha male. <sighs> My alpha male face. Um, <laughs> he, he <laughs> He's gonna teach us how real men talk to women. Or as he says, girls. Seriously, there's so much infantilizing of women in this book. Everyone's a girl, 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 child, girl. There is an actual child coming up later, so that's fun. However, just before we get to that, he absolutely shows himself up by not understanding that men and women have the ability to be friends. Now we've seen a little bit of this before, but there's even more of it. Uh, he just assumes that all men are as predatory as he is. So not only is he absolutely uh, underestimating women in this book and being incredibly misogynistic, but he's also underestimating men and treating all men like they're as big a bags of crap as he is. Which isn't really fair on men, is it? There's some nice ones out there somewhere, probably. Don't let a single guy and a group of girls stop you from approaching because chances are, he's trying to bang one of the girls and would welcome another male to distract her friends. This comes up again in a section which he titles Nature vs Nurture, and it's odd because on the one hand I do agree with its premise, which is, you know, socialising and knowing how to talk to people doesn't come naturally to everyone, myself included, but it is a skill that you can learn. I know because I'm naturally pretty terrible at it, um, and to kind of get to where I am today and be able to kind of talk, not necessarily comfortably with people, but at least productively with people. Um, I've read a lot of books and I've watched a lot of videos and I've practiced a lot. And to this day, there's still things that I don't understand or feel comfortable with, like small talk. Why do it? What's the point? It never feels natural. Mm, I can't pull it off at all. But on the whole, with like time and practice and effort, you can kind of have some really good, meaningful conversations with people once you kind of get comfortable with it and learn how to do it and spend time learning things like how to read body language a bit better and how to understand tone of voice and how to convey your own tone of voice to make sure you're actually um, conveying what you want. That was a big skill that took me a while, but not doing so bad now, am I? And um, that said, so that's kind of the basic sentiment of this section of his book and it's not too bad. But, on the other hand, it's also full of crap. Like this line. No more than 10% of men have an innate ability to talk to girls, to build attraction, 
and to rack up more notches in a year than most men get in a lifetime. To them, playing the game doesn't work. It's like hanging out with friends. Okay, a few things here. One, that statistic is pulled completely from his bottom and doesn't exist. Two, he forgets that women can and do struggle with socialising too, especially autistic women. The only difference is we tend to be better at masking kind of quicker and earlier in life because society puts more pressure on women to do that. When you don't mask, you end up with like, you know, living in pure hell like I did in my teen years where you're just like completely outcast from everyone and relentlessly bullied. So there's a lot more pressure on women to mask a lot more often and to get better at it quicker, you know? Not the point, anyway. Three, notice again how he has two categories of people, girls and friends, and how he can't possibly conceive that a girl could be a friend? What is this? Also, again, I've said this before, but notice how he keeps calling us girls and not women. Girls is only a slight step up from females, isn't it? It's infantilizing, it's patronizing, and it suggests that he only ever approaches women who are probably young, naive, and vulnerable. Which is just a bit gross on his part, isn't it? And this isn't just like a few one-off claims based on like one little thing I've read in the book here. This is based on the patterns that I've seen throughout like seven of his books. This is an ongoing thing. It keeps happening over and over and over. So then he starts on how to have conversations with women and it's very odd. <laughs> he gives these examples that just all feel very unnatural. And like I've said before, I struggle with things like small talk and socialising in general and I had to try very hard to learn sort of basic social skills. But one of the biggest and best things I learned in conversation is ultimately just skip the small talk. Stop asking what you think you're supposed to ask and what you think you're supposed to do and all that stuff. And just talk about whatever you're passionate about and ask people about their passions. Ask them questions that you're genuinely interested in hearing and really listen when people talk and that's the way you can have like really good engaging enjoyable conversations and when you stop worrying about what you should be saying and doing and just kind of start asking you know the things you want to know and just like actually taking an interest in people it makes everything a lot easier and a lot better but Rouge's approach is different <laughs> he says conversation threads can be categorized into themes the first theme is people, which includes conversations about you, her, or others. It concerns appearances, trends, rumours, gossip, and observations. People watching. Go on to give your thoughts about how people look in the environment you're in and the patterns you've noticed. For instance, if she's wearing a large necklace, say, Have you noticed that the things people are wearing around their necks are getting larger and larger? Throw in a Flavor Flav reference and see. <laughs> about how he pioneered large neck jewelry. It's okay to talk about clothing, as long as you show only basic fashion knowledge. If you start dropping in words like couture, the girl may think you're a homosexual. So, neg her. Talk about things you're not really interested in. And don't forget, be a little homophobic too. Yay! <laughs> Why is he like this? <laughs> Gonna be honest here. If I had some really awesome, like, statement piece of jewellery on and a man compared me to Flavor Flav, I would not be touching him. <laughs> he also says, Rumours and gossip are related threads that fall within the people theme. Take advantage of a girl's addiction to both by using them in conversation. <sighs> Example. There's a rumour going around that you don't like my shirt. Is that true? My mum helped me pick it out. <laughs> oh my god, please don't do this. Please don't. I, ca oh. I can't believe a grown man in like, what, his 40s or something is recommending that people say this to pick up girls. See, at this point, it feels like satire, doesn't it? And I wish it was. I really, really, really wish it was. Other lines he recommends are, I uh, thought I'd get a private table with balls of grey goose, but I think I'll keep it low-key tonight, you know? Mingle with the commoners. I hope this is a good place where I can find an older woman to wine and dine me and 
take me on vacation. <sighs> Music here is kind of lame. Hope they put on some Madonna soon. So I was recently at a bar in uh, Barcelona where the, there's this main main floor where everyone danced and uh, there's a small room upstairs that had only men in it. It was so small and they were touching and grinding on each other. It was interesting. This is a really good one because, you know, you wouldn't want someone thinking you were gay, so... Wait. Wait. He then says one of the things you should do is ask if she cooks. Um, and if she can, you compare her to another woman in your life, like your female roommate who makes chicken nuggets. Um, and if she can't, and you love home-cooked meals, say, MINUS A MILLION POINTS! As if you're keeping a running tally of her worth. Or of course, one of his final lines that he recommends is the classic, in which you ask them if they go to the gym, mock them for not being as strong as you, and then, he says, I flex for her, and tell her how I dominate the gym and scare little children. Oh, feel free to add, uh, actually I uh, got so big I had to stop going to the gym for a while. Um, he then goes on a long rant about how to neg women, but he doesn't call it negging, of course, uh, but it's very clear that's what it is. He's like, don't compliment them, but don't insult them either. Make jokes about how they'd usually be too old for you, but for this one you'll make an exception, or how she's not actually as cold and unfriendly as you first thought she was. Classic negging. Classic. Yeah, don't do this. It's rude, it's manipulative, it's cruel, and mostly, it won't work. And to everyone watching this who might have fallen for negging, negging in the past, um, I would advise, learn what negging is, learn how to spot it, and avoid anyone who uses it at all costs. It's horrible. His other ridiculous conversation rules include never asking for her name first, um, and if she asks you what you do for work, it means she's boring and unoriginal. Um, but I, I think he just hates being asked what he does for work because it would be embarrassing to admit that it's this. I wouldn't want people to know either if I wrote books like this. But he does have a couple of go-to answers for this question though. Um, so number one, he lies about being a farmer and fabricates details of the plants he grows. Number two, he refuses to answer the question at all and says, You've only known me for so-and-so minutes. What about my job could possibly tell you more than a natural conversation with me? Hell of a lot. How about, because it tells me if you're a responsible adult who actually works for a living, uh, it tells me what your interests are, where your morals lie, and if we're going to be compatible. You know, like, for example, if you're a vegan and someone you're interested in works in an abattoir, you're probably not going to be compatible. Finding out someone's job will tell you that. Um, plus, it's just an interesting thing to know about people and it can start some good conversations. And three, he says to tell her, and this is an exact quote from the book, I, again, can't believe this isn't satire. Right now I'm unemployed. I sit at home in my father's basement most of the day, surfing message boards on the internet. Then I go to the bookstore and read books for free because the library's too dirty for me. She'll ask if you're serious. Say that you are, then smile. <laughs> he says, there's a chance that a girl with a princess personality will be turned off by the fact that you don't feed her information on demand. She'll need to know right now what you do for a living or she won't be able to bear spending another minute talking with you. I let these girls go because if she needs to know what I do before she can talk to me, she isn't all that interested in getting banged. Trust me, mate, I don't think any woman is interested in getting banged banged by you. And he says like the, the unemployment line and stuff like that, that's to like weed out the gold diggers and stuff. He doesn't say gold diggers but he's like, he implies that's what it's doing. It's ridiculous. Anyway, this all just sounds exhausting, like all these rules and tricks, it's so goal oriented and it just sounds boring. Like I wouldn't want to have a conversation with him. It just sounds dull as hell. Like has this man just ever had a nice enjoyable conversation with someone, anyone, just purely for the sake of enjoying conversation. He's seriously missing out, like his life must be so dull and so tiring and just so fake, you know? Um, and then he has this whole section on how to have conversations with women when you dump them, which according to him is inevitable, obviously. Uh, he has this one method in particular which he says is painless, in which he fakes getting back together with an ex after saying he was totally over her. It's really messed up. I've had this happen to me in real life, not the fake thing, but it actually happening and people like dumping me for their exes and like, it's happened a lot. 
and it hurts like hell. Like, it really, really does. It has happened so many times that I have, like, the worst tr trust issues, and it's really messed me up, and it's something I'm having to work through a hell of a lot in therapy. This is not painless. She will not understand the predicament. This is cruel and disgusting, and it will mess people up. It's horrible. And finally, he advises if a woman, and I quote, makes snide remarks, gets in your face, or waves her hands in the air, you should threaten to hit her. He says, it's important in such cases to assert your dominance. You must go over the top and come back at her harder than she came at you. This means you have to scare her into thinking you're going to level her. Say, get out of my face or I'm gonna knock you out. She'll back down because no woman wants to get punched by a man. I get that no one wants to be around someone who's being horrible to them, but being aggressive and violent just because you can and just to assert your dominance is disgusting. No one should use violence against anyone. No one should threaten violence against anyone. So apparently that's how you talk to women. Yay. Um, but his threatening violence isn't the only scary thing about him. Um, he displays so much predatory behavior throughout his books that I've actually compiled a section in which we're gonna look at all of his predatory behavior um, and we're gonna discuss that in the final section of this video. But before then, it's time to scare ourselves silly by listening to Roosh talk in way too much detail about his sex life. I call this section Bad in Bed because he is. So, there is this wonderfully ironic moment in his first book where Roosh writes, those who talk about sex the most are the ones who get it the least, which is just beautifully ironic, it's delicious, it's all. Oh. I thought about this a lot when I was reading his book, 30 Bangs, The Shaping of One Man's Game from Patient Mouse to Rabbit Wolf, which is literally a compilation of barely believable, objectifying and outright embarrassing for him stories of, and then I slept with this girl, and then this girl, and then this girl, and then this girl. Like I said earlier, it's like really, 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 really badly written erotica. So, this next section is quite graphic. It's not very pleasant to listen to. If you're a child, I recommend you do not, because it will scar you for life. But if I had to read this stuff, you guys have to listen. This is how it works, okay? Suffering shared is probably suffering multiplied, but please come with me on this. I don't want to suffer alone. <laughs> I'd pin her against the wall and make sure she felt my veiny monster pressing against her crotch. There's nothing sexy about this, nothing at all. No one wants to hear your hyperbolic fantasies about your veiny monster. It gets worse too. I reached into my jeans pocket and pulled out a condom. I tore open the packaging with my teeth like an angry bear. <laughs> Seriously, this book does nothing but make him look bad. So in one story, after going to a dance class to try and meet women, he finally finds one who happens to be a virgin who knows literally nothing about sex. So she has nothing to compare this experience to and yet he still manages to disappoint her and then go on to brag about it. It's, this is really embarrassing for him. I got the condom and had trouble putting it on until I realized it was backwards. I finally got it on and then after five minutes of trying, I penetrated her vagina. I humped her like a small dog. She didn't make any sounds, telling me to stop before I came. I wouldn't normally publicly shame someone for sex, but for this man I'll make an exception. Because how do you think humping her like a dog until she tells you to stop is something worthy of bragging about? And all of his experiences are like this, and he wrote a whole book about it. You can tell he knows nothing about sex and intimacy and pleasing a partner because of how he defines sex in general. He says, if you strip sex down to its physical components, it's an act during which a man inserts a rod-shaped mass of engorged tissue into a woman's lubricated cavity, also made of tissue. A man rubs his rod in and out, stimulating pleasure receptors in his brain until it decides to eject a genetic package that's important in continuing the species. Oh my god, he has no idea, does he? He knows nothing about sex. He knows nothing. There is so much more to it than that. Does he not realize that there are plenty of gay couples and people of all gender identities who have a range of genitals between them all, who have very happy, healthy sex lives that look nothing like this description? Now I'm gonna bet they're more fulfilled than any of Rush's partners have ever been. It's just, this is such a weird, not even just like hetero view of sex, but like, I don't, oh, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like, it's very narrow. 
it's quite boring. And from this and his other books, he does seem kind of boring sexually, which is very odd from a man who brags about having so much sex. None of what he writes about sounds very passionate or adventurous, he doesn't sound very knowledgeable at all. Honestly, he sounds naive and very inexperienced, if I'm honest. A lot of the stories he writes sounds like a man who's never had sex describing what he thinks sex is going to be. Does that make sense? And I think a big part of like this is because this is a man who said his idea of kinky was having sex with a woman who kept her socks on. So I guess I, I don't know what I was expecting really. The thing is, right, I'm saying all this stuff about him, but these are not sentiments that I would say about everyone. Like when we talk about people in general, naivety or inexperience is never anything to be ashamed about. It's not a problem, there's nothing wrong with that. Not having an interest in sex isn't a problem at all. Wanting to keep things simple and basic and not being adventurous is not a problem. But <laughs> none of those things alone are issues. If you want just very, very basic hetero cis sex, you do that, there's nothing wrong with it. But <laughs> Maybe don't write like seven books bragging about what a crazy wild sex god you are and how every man needs to be exactly like you when you're bad, basic and boring in bed. So what's funny, or like not necessarily funny, but ironic, I guess, is that he later goes on to say, you can mould a girl by criticising negative behaviour. You can also criticise girls for not being adventurous enough in bed. Really? you're gonna criticise someone for not being adventurous enough, Mr. I've only got three moves I do every time. It's the hypocrisy and lack of self-awareness that just infuriates the hell out of me, you know? But looking back at his de definition of sex, look how cis male focused that is. Like by seeing ejaculation as the only goal of sex, he is missing out on so much. It gets worse too. He says, if a girl is whining about wanting to get banged more, meaning most girls do that because he has never made a woman orgasm in his life, do her a second or third time when you're going to last longer. The first time is for you, the second time can be for her after you've had your main orgasm. How ridiculously selfish can you get? No wonder he's bad in bed and all these women are complaining. And like, like a theme in all these stories is not only does he just admit to the women who complain about him being bad in bed, but none of these women want to see him more than once or twice. None of them. <laughs> oh, and I can see why. Don't be too concerned about your sexual technique. Porn is my teacher and all I do is pump away while changing the speed, depth and force. Yeah, this is why you can't satisfy a woman. Right there. I feel only pity for every single one of his partners that he's ever had, if they exist. If you like it rough, bang her rough. Keep doing what you do until she complains, which will be unlikely. Or how about you communicate with your partner and get consent before you do anything. Communication and consent make everything better for everyone. Never ever be rough with someone without discussing it first because that's assault. He, I can't believe he even recommends this. He recommends don't ask if you're pleasing her. After sex, don't ask if she came. Worrying about her pleasure sacrifices your own and doesn't guarantee that she'll be pleased in the end. My advice, do the exact opposite of this. Do communicate, do check in, do bother treating your partner or partners like humans. Shocking, I know. The stuff he writes in this book is so bizarre to the point where I genuinely like wondered if he was trolling at times, but there's just so much of it. And so much seems so sincere, I just, I wish he was trolling, but I really don't think he is. Like this one story, he brags about getting a girl's number and then he wears her down and then he later brags about having like mediocre sex with her. But in the middle, he just throws in this line out of nowhere. There was no point to this. This isn't a Chekhov's gun. This isn't a funny little anecdote that ends up being like silly and like coming back to backfire or whatever. It's just, it's a pointless overshare where he says, I don't remember what the thinking behind my strategy was, but I insisted she come over to my house to bake a box of fudge brownies. This was in spite of the fact that brownies give me gas. Why did you need to tell us that? Stop. There's so many of these like I'm bad in bed confessions, like here's, here's some more. Once there I tried to kiss her, but our faces didn't quite align right. And there was an awkward moment until she said, let's try again. Another one. She paid me a grievous insult saying my foreplay was lazy and automaton like. I decided I'd never give her my dick again as long as I lived. Good on this woman. <laughs> His ego wasn't just fragile here, it was completely decimated. For all we're having a giggle about this, I'm like, ha ha, he's not good in bed. The scary thing is that there are times where he's not just 
being a bit rubbish and lazy, but he's physically hurting and assaulting and raping women, and he admits to this and brags about it, and that's absolutely terrifying. Here's just one example, but we're going to talk about a hell of a lot more in the next section of this video. Warning here, because this is hard to hear, it's hard to read, it's horrible, so just be prepared, I understand if you want to skip it. I eased my dick into her and she screamed loud enough for people in the hills to hear. For what seemed to be the next hour, I worked my cock in an eighth of an inch at a time, getting impatient and trying to stuff it in after pouring lubricant all over her vagina. She was so tense and in so much pain that I kind of felt bad for her. But I just kept going until she finally stopped me, unable to take any more abuse. I never got it in more than halfway. The next morning, I busted out with even more lube and got it in enough so we were having what resembled sex. She squirmed and yelped while I was saying things like, you're doing fine and I'm almost there. I eventually blasted and collapsed in a heap next to her. I saw her a couple times after that, but she always had an excuse for why she couldn't have sex. I'm pretty sure I ruined it for her forever. Poor girl. This isn't a funny or a cute or silly story. This is assault. This is rape. If she's screaming, squirming, yelping, you stop. And this isn't just like a one-off occasion either, as we'll sadly see in the next part of the video. And causing pain and assaulting women isn't the only way he's causing physical harm. He's also likely spreading around a crap ton of STDs. And this is also something to worry about. He literally brags at one point, now I try to fuck just about every girl raw. Now the thing about STDs is that you can be incredibly responsible, you can take all the precautions, and you can still accidentally catch one. And there's no shame in that. As long as you try to be careful, as long as you are being responsible, as long as you get tested regularly, as long as you get it treated, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It happens, it's part of being an adult sometimes. You know, most STDs are treatable, and it's not something you should feel bad about. I'm not here to shame people who get STDs at all. That's not the problem. However, if you're purposefully being irresponsible and you're not using protection on purpose with multiple partners, then you are putting yourself and your partner and any of their partners at risk. You are being irresponsible, you're being unsafe, and that is something to be ashamed of. He also gives out absolutely terrible and incorrect advice, a little sprinkling of homophobia in there. On the one hand, he says, yep, yeah, STDs happen, if you get one, get it treated, which is fine, absolutely correct, all good. But then he goes on to say, as for HIV, it's not something you should worry about unless you're gay or an IV drug user. Personally, I wouldn't have sex with a girl who did IV drugs or got banged in the butt by bisexual men. This feels offensive and homophobic and just like compounding on the stigma around bisexual men and it's not okay. Yes, there are some things that you need to be aware of, like how anal sex comes with a higher risk of contracting HIV because it's easier to spread through those means, but the way he speaks about bisexual men and acts all dismissive like, oh, it can't possibly happen to me, I'm too straight for that. It's incorrect, it's offensive, it's, mm -hmm, it's incredibly problematic. But hey, even through all the admitting to assault and spreading STDs and all that stuff, at least he's giving totally useful practi practical advice, like when he spends 15 pages describing how to take off various items of women's clothes. It's bizarre. Like, sorry, but who are you writing for when you say, to take off her panties, put your hands on the sides and wiggle them down a couple of inches. Just stop. And on the subject of stop, let's move on to the next category where we discuss his predatory behavior that he just openly admits to. So the main section of the book Bang about approaching women just all screams, I'm a predator, to varying degrees. So enjoy. There are house parties. Parties can serve you well because a girl's guard will be low due to the fact she's in the company of people she knows and trusts. Now most normal people would think, ah, a woman feeling comfortable. This is good because it means she'll feel safe and happy and protected, and as a caring human being, I care about the safety of others. But not Rouge. Rouge sees this and thinks, ah, look, she's letting her guard down. Better take advantage of it while I can. It's predatory. And he continues with this sort of theme as well. Uh, look at how he views alcohol. I don't buy a drink for a woman on a date to please her. I buy it to loosen her up. Now, I like a drink as much as for anyone who drinks, you know, I, maybe not as much as anyone. I like a nice glass of wine every now and again. Sometimes in a bar I'll have a cheeky vodka and lemonade, you know, have a little bit of a bad dance. It's great. I love it. But if anyone, and I mean anyone, friend, date, family member gave me a drink 
to loosen me up, that would not be okay. If a person decides to have an alcoholic drink to help themselves relax, that is fine. That is their personal choice. But if a person gives someone else an alcoholic drink to make them relax, that is not okay. That is predatory. They are trying to get you in a vulnerable state to take advantage of you. Likely. It's not okay. He then continues on with his like rants about places to meet women. So the party was one of them. Um, another one he says is that he wishes he could go back to college so he could sit next to the hottest girl in class and game her. I know. What do you think of this? Do you have any complaints to make? Yeah, I know. Me too. Me too. I thoroughly agree. You're a smart young lady. Here's another one. Under the guise of shopping for a female relative, prowls stores asking female salespeople and girl shoppers for their opinions on various products. The fact that he's so comfortable with describing his actions as prowl, stalk, oh, it's terrifying. And it's not just women who have to worry, children are in danger too. Wherever women are, oh look, one of the few times he calls them women and he's not actually talking about a woman. The irony. Wherever women are, it's possible to approach them. The only limits to where you meet women exist in your head. I remember one time I got the number of a 17 year old girl who was walking with a pizza while I was sitting in the passenger seat of a friend's car. A child. You hit on a child. You harassed a child. I know. I'll never let anyone do that to you. There's just a complete lack of care about absolutely anyone else in everything he writes. Some guys have the belief that girls don't want to be approached, but it shouldn't be up to her what you decide to do. If you like her, go up to her and make an attempt. What she thinks really doesn't matter. After some drinking and dancing, I took her home under the guise of getting a nightcap. Even with several drinks in her system, she still put up a robust resistance to taking any of her clothes off. I slept with a throbbing hard on, my balls aching in pain. You're too young to hear this. Cover your ears. The way he talks about virgins and inexperienced women too is absolutely revolting. So I will preface this by saying, if you happen to be a virgin and you're hearing what he's saying here, please know it is all complete and utter crap and ignore every single word of it, please. Her virginity is a disease and you're the cure. Be aggressive with your escalation moves because you're not going to change your game just because she has a problem of sexual inexperience. Break her down by constantly pushing until she relents. You have strong sexual needs for her to fulfill within a reasonable amount of time or else you'll move on. Inexperience is not a disease. It's not a problem. It's not bad. And you should never feel pushed or pressured to have sex or do anything sexual before you're ready. Whether it's your first time or your thousandth time, never feel pressured into it by anyone, please. And the people who might be doing the pressuring, stop it. It's disgusting. I think one of the scariest stories, and that's saying a lot based on some of them in these books, um, is called The Train. And in this, Roosh and his friend make a bet that they can both sleep with the same girl in the same night. And everything is wrong with this story. They fluctuate between hitting on this blonde girl and hitting on another group of girls who they describe as slightly frumpy. Um, ultimately, Roosh takes the blonde girl, girl home and sleeps with her and tries to get his friend to as well, but the friend won't do it. And this all happens despite the fact that this woman was clearly not in a fit state to consent. She clearly could not, and he admits this. I noticed that something was wrong with the girl. She seemed slow, more than alcohol alone could explain. We'd say something to her and she'd give us a deer in the headlights look for several long seconds, then say, huh? Clearly she's taken some kind of substance, she is completely out of it, and the fact he still pursued her and had sex with her after this, especially because she knocks him back a few times too, and he waits until she's like, peek out of it and then sleeps with her. It's revolting, she could not consent. This is rape. You're bragging about rape. And then he has the nerve to follow up this story by saying, my respect for womankind continued its free fall descent. The only person who doesn't deserve respect here is him. In a number of other stories, he continues to prove that he 
absolutely does not understand the concept of consent and it's absolutely terrifying. Like there's so many of these. So there was, there's the um, drunk girl on whatever drugs. There's the woman who was like squealing and yelping earlier. There's the people who keep asking him to stop. And then there are these stories. When a girl makes the decision to have sex with you, you must quickly capitalize on her decision before any variables change, before doubt kicks in, before a friend cock blocks you, before her ex-boyfriend calls to propose marriage, before she wonders if she's already slept with too many men for her age, or before anything else in her life distracts her. No, people have the right to change their mind at any time, and if they do, you need to respect that. Trying to worm your way in until she, like, before she can change her mind. Like, oh, I just, this idea of, like, taking your chance while you can, like, I don't like it. It proves to me that he doesn't fully believe that these women are actually consenting. He's just stealing what he can while he can, you know? Uh, look at this story too, like, clearly we have a woman here who's saying she didn't want to have sex, she didn't want to go upstairs with him because she knew where it would lead, and she didn't want it to go there, and he still kept pushing and pushing and pushing until he got his own way. He coerces women into sex. It's sickening. At her place she made a couple of drinks and I finally went for a kiss on the couch. We were soon going at it, then I said why don't we go upstairs? We can't go upstairs because then I'll have sex with you. Five minutes passed and I asked again, so why don't we go upstairs? Again she replied, we can't go upstairs because then I'll have sex with you. I figured I'd have to try something different if I wanted to get her upstairs. I waited for another five minutes and said, why don't we go upstairs? But we won't have sex. I just want to cuddle. And I'm being completely serious. No, because if I take you upstairs I'm going to want to have sex with you. Doesn't matter because we're not having sex. It's just that your couch is uncomfortable. I just want to be a little more comfortable. Well, okay, fine. True to her word, we had sex upstairs. So here's a woman who's clearly saying, I don't want to have sex with you. I don't want to be in a position where sex is going to be inevitable because I don't want to have it. I don't want to put myself in a vulnerable position. And he's saying, no, let me, let me, let me. It's okay. I won't take advantage. And then he takes advantage. This is coercion. There are tons of other examples of this too, of him just pushing and pushing, pushing women, even after they say no. <sighs> In my room we got down to business. After some more kissing I got all her clothes off except her bra and panties. I ended up completely naked. Then I tried to remove her panties but I was denied. Not phased at all, I tried again a few minutes later, only to be denied again. I tried several more times but still nothing. I lost count of how many times I tried that night until it felt too creepy to continue. When we got up in the morning I tried a couple more times. At that point my balls were in severe pain. I still couldn't get her panties off, they were locked and I didn't have the key. It was a little awkward the entire time because I was naked like a gorilla while she wasn't. I've since learned to keep my boxers on until a girl gets naked first. Really, that's what you learned from this. That line, it, I kept, he kept pushing until he felt too creepy to continue. Keeping trying at all after you've been told no is creepy. It's not okay. It, uh, he's creepy and predatory all the time. He doesn't understand the word no. He thinks no means try again, try again, try again, try again. That's not okay. That particular story gets worse too because he eventually like wears her down until she does eventually sleep with him. And then he says, the reason she didn't see me as a creep was because she was attracted to me and because I didn't rape her. <laughs> Congratulations on not raping a woman. What a great man you are. Well done. Woo! It's so hard not to rape, isn't it? Good job. Good job. How are we at such a low point that a man has to brag about not raping a woman? It's okay, he didn't rape her. He only coerced her into sex. They're not the same thing. No, no. He actually has the audacity to write in one of his books. When it comes to resistance, there are two types of no. The first is, no, I wouldn't have sex with you even if the continuation of the human species depended on it, which is what I think most of us are feeling. And the second is, no, I don't want to have sex with you yet. The former can never be overcome, but the latter can. No. It doesn't matter what kind of resistance it is. It doesn't matter what, ki what kind of no it is. If it's a no, it's a no and you stop. He literally says, you need to keep trying it on. But, oh. Keep going until you feel a weird vibe that makes it seem as if you're going backwards instead of forward. 
This is awful, dangerous advice. Even in the appendix of one of his books, he has a section titled, if you don't feel like a creep, you're not pushing hard enough. He says, she's not gonna tell you she wants to have sex with you. She's not gonna grab your dick and put it in. Now, I don't doubt that no woman has ever said that to him, but with men who are actually, you know, nice and kind and respectful and not massive douchebags, yeah, this does happen quite a lot. Women do say this. Women do do this when they're interested in you. When a person actually wants to have sex and hasn't just been coerced into it, many people will happily say and do this. But Roosh doesn't think this happens because it's never happened to him because he's so repulsive. <laughs> I'm very angry, I'm sorry. If you're scared she'll think of you as a creep, that means you're on the right path. No, it means you are on completely the wrong path. So there you have it. I am getting a little emotional at this point, I'm sorry. It... Here is a man who has admitted to stalking, pestering, coercing women into sex, assaulting them, threatening violence against them, getting them drunk to have sex with, um, raping someone on the, under the influence of various unknown substances who clearly couldn't consent, continued to penetrate a screaming woman asking him to stop. He's admitted to all of this stuff and he couldn't care less. He is bragging about it. This is a disgusting and dangerous man and I completely support banning these books. I, for all people talk about, yay, freedom of speech, yay, yeah. no, this should not be allowed. People should not be able to freely make money off bragging about raping and assaulting people. The sad thing is that Amazon UK haven't banned a lot of these books. They're still for sale on there. He's still making money off this and it's repulsive. This man, Rouge V, is a dangerous predator who is encouraging and teaching other men to be dangerous predators too, and that needs stopping. And, with me being a little emotional, that's where we're going to end things today. So, I know this has been a long one, but, hey, it's okay. And I know it's been hard to listen to in places. It's been hard to read, it's been hard to talk about, it's not very nice stuff, is it, baby? But thank you for joining me today. Thank you for joining us with my little support pup. Kyra, you have been an excellent co-host. Thank you, baby. Thank you. I know I love you too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, please let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Please let me know what you think of this absolute piece of rubbish. Um, and thank you for watching. I'll see you again soon. Would you like a walk? Yeah? <laughs> Bless her.